Not just at the dark, uh, unfiltered and uncensored talk from young alumni of historically black college and universities. We got Tiff about to be thrown off the show for sure. Hanging with Q's, uh, frat brother Eric, line brother KD, Winston, get him into school. Um, let's get into it because I, I, you know, we, I think we, in some form, we always discuss COVID and the impact on HBCUs, right? And so it would appear that all that the epidemiologists have predicted for this winter is coming true. Um, in the form that they said it would. And the only thing that is is staying the same in a regrettable way is that HBCUs are, are still, um, I guess, quiet on what the plans would be for the spring. And I'm not just talking about athletics, I'm talking about academics as well. Uh, while most schools or some schools have, have announced intentions of uh, coming back to in-person instruction or hybrid instruction with online, uh, the numbers, of hospitalizations, deaths, uh, infections continue to increase. Uh, so we will go around the horn and ask the obvious question, what do you think is going to happen in the spring uh, when we're already pr pretty much at home and cases are going to go up by the time we return uh, following the winter break? Uh, so we will start with, actually with Winston getting them into school because this is, um, this is going to continue to have significant impact, particularly as most schools have rolling admissions um, and some folks actually start in the spring. What kind of trends are you seeing with young people thinking about what to do about school selection in the spring semester? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I think this 2021 class that we're working with is a little bit more used to this whole navigating the pandemic and school thing. Um, more so than, than 2020. So I think at least the conversation that I've had preliminarily, I think some of them are prepared for the possibility of not being on a physical campus initially, um, or at least at least preparing themselves, having the conversations about, you know, realistically, they may or may not be able to be on a physical campus right away. Um, and I think they've kind of sided with that a little bit more than the last class did. I think 2020 was kind of, you know, living under the illusion or not even illusion, the reality at their time was that they would end up on a campus. So it hasn't been as difficult a conversation to have about the possibility of them not being on a campus. Um, so they seem to be siding with it a little bit better and kind of navigating a little bit better. I think the realities of what we'll see in the spring are probably very similar to what we saw in the fall. I think there'll be some schools, you know, like who stick with the hybrid idea. There'll be some that are going to be like, we're not doing anything physical on campus. Um, and then there, those are kind of wait and see. And I actually kind of applaud the HBCUs for taking the position of I'm not we're not going to speak too early until we're in a position to be definitive about what it looks like. I think that speaks to leadership um, and to, uh, you know, just kind of getting a pulse of what where we are when it's time to make final decisions that they're trying not to cause too much of a stir before they have to. And really making sure that they evaluate and vet what makes sense for young people. And as we see, at, you know, as far as athletics, you know, folks are already making decisions about what they think is the best interest and in the health of the student bodies coming to campus. So, Tiffany, we, we we're just a few months out from actually being a year into life with COVID, right? So, d d you would think you would think from I guess from an enrollment management perspective, from an operational perspective, that it's like okay, you've seen this before, but in actuality, you haven't seen it before because you know we started at a certain point which was bad went down a little now we're really bad and they're saying it's going to get worse from really bad so how do you think that the the the, the campus uh, for lack of a better term administrative culture or should consider life what, what was once bad when it first started is now really bad is it a same it is is it the same set of rules in your opinion um, yes and no, because we know that I don't want to answer it like that. Okay. Yes and no. And I say yes and no, because there are some instances where some students have done well, have, have been able to adjust and perform like they would in any other perform well, like they would in any other semester. But then we also see that there are some students that just can't get it. Um, I've also noticed that, you know, on a lower level of things, given what my new position is, that, you know, on the high school level, students are definitely struggling and thinking about that next 
um, step in talking to the high school administrators um, about getting their students to this next step, they don't know either. And one thing that uh, one high school administrator said to me like last week was that they have trouble um, getting their kids to show up to Zoom class. And so I said, yeah, I feel it. I understand. Um, you know, students need to be together. And, I, and one thing that I've noticed about at least where I am now is that we've had our students here and we've had them together. And I think that's been um, a saving grace for them for the most part. Um, but, you know, you can't do that on a lower level. Um, and even still, there was still some some risk in doing that here um, because Corona was still on campus. Um, so it's 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 a yes and a no. Katie, do you think that people at this point are taking it seriously or, or taking it? I think people always took it seriously. But do you think they're taking it gravely seriously? Like we we have to stay indoors. Whatever we were doing with in person, we have to more strictly enforce it. Remember, at the beginning of the, of the fall semester, even though we had restrictions and guidelines, students were still standing around outside. They probably was gathering. But now that you see the kid condition now, do you think people are saying, OK, students are saying we're going to abide by non gathering rules and, and administrators are probably going to say we're going to be stricter about police and people standing around and being more more uh, closely guarded about the new rules. In other words, are we just as serious as, as we were about it before? Are we are we likely to be more serious now in the spring? I think the best way to answer that question is to, is to say that it will be regional. So for schools down south who can hang outside in the wintertime, maybe not as much. But, mm. but um, you know, northeast in the cold where it gets cold in the cold months and winter months here, uh, probably a little more so, especially in New York, Maryland, D.C., where uh, we are not used to our hospital systems being overwhelmed. And they're some of the best in the country. And so I think when you see that, when you see the inability to go to the doctors for just a regular ailment, um, you will find that people are like, okay, I want life to get back to normal. I want to be able to see my doctor under normal circumstances. What do I have to do? And our governors, for the most part, are taking it a little more seriously, which I think helps. I think as long as leadership takes it seriously, the citizens will take it seriously. But then you got stuff like, um, <clears throat> I think the mayor of San Francisco got caught on vacation uh, in the midst of a <laughs> pandemic. Right. And so when you see right. stuff like that, it's like you're saying one thing, doing the exact opposite. And that is with the terrorist progress in this case. And like you said, we're getting into the darker months. Um, the prediction is, what, 400,000 deaths due to COVID by February? Um so, you know, it doesn't, and a, the sad thing about Americans is that we don't take anything serious until it affects us. So the question is how many grandparents, how many, um, you know, people with uh, lung, uh, lung associated diseases are gonna pass away before people, you know, wake up and decide to stay home and put masks on. Eric, do you think that it's, it, it continues to be a wise move on the administration's part to kind of slow walk what they're going to do. Cause I, I think Winston made a good point that it's, it's wise to not rush and say, all right, no in-person instruction, especially when we don't know what the deal will be with the vaccine. We assume it's like six, six to nine months out before everybody can get it. Who knows what the, the, the conditions will be on that being mandatory to even enroll in school, which we talked about before. But do you think that administration is doing, is doing the right thing, um, in terms of operation and infrastructure by saying, hey, we are where we are. You know, we got to follow these rules and this is what we're going to have to do. And I think it, it's a mixed bag um, in the sense that you could be in Maryland and there's a set of rules in North Carolina, there's a set of rules and in Florida, there's a set of rules and all of them are different. But you're still vying for students who can go to all, one of the three, any one of the three. Um, you know, you're still trying to vie to keep faculty. And there, you know, you're you're thinking about, okay, that I could have a rash of retirements based on what the rules are. Are, are. are they are they in good position now in your in your perspective, the administration on how they're handling looking ahead to the next the next semester? Oh, you on mute, bro. To put it short, no. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna sound it's gonna sound really bad, but because when you're sitting out, when you're sitting back and waiting, right? 
some people are sitting here saying like, oh, well, we're, we're trying to just like gauge things as, as it goes. But the unfortunate thing is, is that with the world we live in, if you're still if you're kind of sitting back waiting for somebody else to make a decision that can impact you, you're still going to be late because what happens is that and I'm speaking from the perspective of an academic advisor. I've worked at two different schools in the last three months. I was transitioning jobs and everything. But the amount of students that are still sitting here asking questions like, okay, so what are the plans for the spring? What are the plans for next summer? Uh, Cause I don't, I don't know if I want to register for classes because I don't know what's going to happen soon. Right. And then anybody who's, who works with an enrollment works with academic advising, you know how difficult your job is as far as getting numbers. When you literally have to be honest with students, you can sit here and tell them, I don't know. And I think a lot of schools are going to run into that issue sooner than later, especially now that we're in this place where, you know, I work at a school that at at the beginning of the academic year, they said that they were going to have online courses only for the entire school year. So there's mm -hmm. no question like there's there's no question of what's going to happen until May at the very latest. Right. So now students just know if you're if you're applying to go to the school, you just know what the situation is. You know the decision that they made and faculty can plan. Advisors can plan, administration can plan. Everybody's somewhat on the same page because at least there's that one constant. When you don't have any constants and everybody's all over the place, you got chaos. So I, I don't. I, our schools, we want to get students. We want. We want to make sure that we're getting that money coming in because it's such an important thing. But at the same time, when you can't, when there's, when, when everything is fluid, you don't put anybody in a good situation. So that's just that's just my perspective. Go ahead, Katie. Um, and then one thing to note, especially for freshmen that may stumble across us having this conversation, um, that spring date is not actually the spring. That's late January, early February, when we'll be at the peak of or, or the, at probably the worst point of this pandemic. So mm -hmm. planning for that is, is key for all of us. Now, their parents may know that, but the students don't. So when they hear spring, they be thinking March, April, when really it's January, February. January, right. February, right. And so that's just something to keep in mind. And I'll actually add to this a little bit. So the UK just approved the Pfizer uh, vaccine, Next, right? Geez, right? Really? They just approved. Mm -hmm. I think it was that either wow. yesterday or the day before. That's so now. Scary. So now everybody's saying wow. there's pressure on the, on the FDA to do the same thing. But my yeah. whole thing. So so my whole thing is two things that are popping up now. One, if the FDA rushes it. Then what? Then what are schools going to do? Are they suddenly going to say, "Okay, yeah, we're back on campus," with us not knowing? I mean, every single year the flu morphs and it's a new strain. You think COVID is not going to do the same thing? And the second thing is, is that where I work today, we just had a conversation, and I can't believe we had it. But the question was, should we instill? Should we instill a rule that you can't come back onto the campus physically unless you get the vaccine? Mm. What do you do then? Because now mm. we're sitting here talking about with all the history that we as people have when it comes to medical racism and things of that nature. If you what, what if North Carolina as a state with a public system with all HBCUs that are public schools says, oh, yeah, we're going to be back on campus physically, but everybody is required to go and get the vaccine. What does that look like for us? Mm. Whew. And that and that's something to think about because with the amount of, of, of black folks who are not gonna trust the early stages of that vaccine distribution, but there's gonna have to be something because you, you might have kids, you might have relatives where they say, Okay, K through twelve, y'all ain't coming back without a vaccine is mandatory. So that changes the game when something becomes mandatory, right? You might have to unwillingly take it, but it could be that you just you're right. You could say, Well, Maryland doesn't have that guideline. I don't wanna take it, so I'll just transfer it to a school in Maryland. Right. Um, I mean, I, that, that, but you know what? Go ahead, Tiff. I, I'm just thinking about how there are some vaccines that are <laughs> mandatory, and I don't. Is it is the is the apprehension uh, history not being a factor here? Um, is the apprehension around a COVID vaccine because it's come out quickly? Yes. Or just okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yes. Hey, but no, I, it's, we we're, not, we're not anti-vaxxing here. We're not. Oh, we're not. Okay. We're not anti-vaxxing. <laughs> well, I'm okay. not. I, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, is that, and I, I was just talking. My girlfriend works in public health. I was just talking to her about this. 
I was like, I have a problem when you're trying to when you're trying to push through a vaccine and you can't tell me where a disease comes from. Right, right. If you can't tell me where it started and like what causes it, then you right. can't tell me that this vaccine fixes it. <laughs> like that doesn't make sense to me. So with right. it being pushed through so soon, I, I have no problem with everybody being like, yeah, nah, I'm gonna wait until it's actually tested out before I even touch that. Yeah, that's fair. And so the other thing to keep in mind is that at, at best case scenario, it's not available to everybody until June. So we're not going to even have that, even have to have this conversation until April, May, because of the way the vaccine is set up. It needs like these incredibly cold storage temperatures. And again, only a few people can make the vaccine effectively. So we are a long way away from actually that being a conversation. So really, we y'all, are, y'all, but y'all are actually segueing into an important point I want to raise in in part two. Let's take a quick break and we're going to touch on this in the next part because all the questions that we're talking about here, this is going to be mixed in with a lot of HBC presidents and chancellors saying, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'm not dealing with it. So Dodgers at the Dark, we'll be right back. We didn't record Dodgers at the Dark and we're back. Uh, (laughs) Fat um, endorsing the power of breast milk. Um, as a COVID salvation, um, let's come back to a conversation. This actually extends to the previous uh, to the previous section about how we're handling uh, COVID nineteen and what's what's what are the likelihood um, measures or what's the likelihood of, of, of sound operability in spring twenty one. And this introduces another interesting conversation about president or HBCU leadership. So yesterday we had Alabama A and M University President Andrew Eugenie announce his retirement effective. June 21 um, that he he's a really you you may not have heard of him if you're out here listening but in the HBCU pantheon he's somebody who's highly respected highly respected for his political his political savvy uh, particularly in 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 red states highly respected for for building enrollment building academic profile this is a this is a good president and he's saying goodbye now I, I talked to him yesterday he said COVID had nothing to do with him wanting to leave but he did go on the record and say, this delayed my desire to leave by a year. I was going to announce this in June. And now I'm going to stay one year to not only one, help the university get through COVID and what that's going to look like, but also to give the board an opportunity to have an effective presidential transition. So I'm asking y'all, and, and I'm telling you, you know, not disclosing, um, you know, people that I've heard or people that I've, with whom I personally talked about, they're leaving. Some folks are going to leave in 21. Um, some big names <laughs> uh, and some small names. Uh, but and I, I don't mean small in that way, but that they're not as large as some of the other ones. But what I will say is some folks are up out of here. And, and part of the reason is that with the uncertainty of COVID and what that will mean for their contracts, what that will mean for their them possibly getting extensions, and what it will mean just for their 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 comfort level. Some folks have just been at it at a while, and they're like, "I don't want to work this hard for something I don't even know what to do." It would be one thing if this was a hurricane. I may have seen that before. It would be one thing if I had a campus shooting. I've seen that before. I've never seen nothing like this. So now I'm going. I'm I'm doing something new that may impact my retirement, may impact my pension, may impact my legacy. So what do you think the prospect is without, again, not divulging too much? What do you think the prospect is when we see a rash of HBCU presidential defections, retirements, force outs, a bunch of other stuff? Eric, I'll start with you because you look skeptical about it. First and foremost, and this I don't feel sorry for anybody who's talking about, well, this is something that I've never seen before. And this is why we were on this podcast months ago and and i said it i said if you if you're smart about it COVID could be the opportunity to really cement your legacy because we as as hbcus we have this problem of doing what we've always done and expecting different results now you have a reason to do something that you've never done and get better results and what do you do nothing so like I, I'm sorry, like the thought process of everybody sitting here talking about, oh well, like I'm staying on to kind of help, and I'm like, no, like what's your track record right now? I don't know who, I don't know which names. I'm not going after anybody in, in, in particular, 
there's some people like if they're offended it's not because i don't i don't like you it's because i look at your track record and be like i mean you built yourself up but did you build your school up like it's just this was one of those things where i'm sitting here like <laughs> things happen every single year there's always something for anybody who's ever been a president of anything who's ever been a director of anything manager of anything things always happen that you never see coming the question yeah. is how do you react and respond in those moments now if you don't get an extension because you didn't respond properly you gonna blame COVID? because if, if that's the case then let's say you're in your fifth year right and this was your fifth year then that means you didn't do nothing in the first four years to make them want to say, oh, well, give them another try because this last year was kind of a wash. So, well, it depends. And I'll give you a perfect example. So 2011, 2012, nobody saw that Parent Plus thing coming. We should have seen it, but nobody saw it. And a lot of people lost their job because the government changed a a financial aid policy. Students didn't come back. A whole bunch of revenue was lost. And the board looked at them and said, somebody got to go and it ain't going to be me. (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to give you an example and this is not talking about anybody in particular but if it feel, but hit dogs holler so if it happens to be the school, your school that's not my fault we're talking about a respiratory disease that we don't know the inception of and you as a president didn't say anything you as a president and or chancellor didn't say anything about your school uh, continuing to have sports this la- this, this fall that's you, dog. That's not. <laughs> that's that's not the government making decisions for you. That's you, dog. Like I'm saying, like it's it's not the same situation, right? So, eh, I, I'm not. I'm sorry. Like every last person that's on this call, every last person who's listening to this podcast, their life has been dramatically changed by COVID. Yeah. So I'm supposed to feel different about you. And how you responded in that moment and how you didn't step up in that moment when you had the ability to because you're a president at an HBCU. If we know anything as black folks is that anything that deals with us doing well for us is going to be impacted negatively by some other people or some other factors that we can't control. This is more this is this is what we know. So I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't I don't have any empathy in that situation. Katie, you have historically opposed the president at Morgan. Um, publicly and privately, if you were to if you were to retire, <laughs> if you were to retire in twenty one, would you say okay, job well done, or would you say oh, COVID ran you up out of here, Jared? Jared, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a little. Bit Everybody of knows I don't like little David. That ain't no <laughs> it's a little bit of both for him. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, he has not run necessarily a a bad operation. Um, he just hasn't pleased all of his. Uh, people in the <laughs> that's the way, that's the way I can frame that. I don't even know why you put that on me. I, I um, you know, I guess it's a case by case basis. I'm not going to fault anybody for being in their mid 60s and 70s and finally wanting to rest, especially with so much unknown going on. I, I, I'm not going to sit there and admonish anybody because as somebody who works in K 12, we're facing the same issue, right? A lot of our principals are baby boomers, that a lot mm-hmm. of them far more than the system is comfortable with. They're scared because <laughs> on our level, students like to touch each other. There's nothing you can do about that. They're teenagers, they're children. Children, they just touch each other. That's what they do. And so it is very easy to see an outbreak happen within our system. So like people taking that health first, you know, considering that health first doesn't bother me at all. Um, the thing that scares me is that we got 100 and what 302 HBCUs or whatever, and let's say 25 retire. <laughs> that is a that leaves our entire system in limbo, right? That's a lot of students out there that haven't made a choice and won't be able to make a choice because there's no leader at the top. It makes it difficult to recruit, makes it difficult to hire, it makes it difficult to state systems to give you money because there's nobody. Um, Represent, sitting in that space that is a somewhat of a permanent fixture and that's the thing that scares me what happens in 2021 22 23 during all of this transition because you could it, it might be that many it might not be but even if it's just 10 that's a lot for us so so let me ask this question tiffany you are an aspiring president is she really instagram would say otherwise but tiffany is a, uh, is an aspiring president um 
He's so would shy. you, if you were in position to apply for presidencies tomorrow, look at someone who is leaving or has recently announced, let's say Alabama A&M, which is in good condition. Enrollment is fine. Money's fine. Profile fine. Would you say with COVID included in it, I'm eager to go get that job? Now, keep in mind, now throw throw the throw the traditional you shouldn't follow a longstanding president logic out, out, out away, which is a general practice. You don't follow a You don't follow a king or a queen. You follow somebody who's a bozo or at least somebody who was an interim or something like that, because nobody wants to follow somebody who's beloved or at least respected for the job that they did. But let's say you were in a position to get a presidency and COVID is sitting on the doorstep. I'm and, and COVID is going to to dictate how many students you have, what your money looks like, what your construction looks like, what your personnel looks like, what your legislative agenda looks like, what your legislative lobbying looks like. Would you be eager to jump into a job like that? First, thank you for the question. I'm going to answer that question last. Um, <laughs> first, I would like to um, suggest that it's more than HBCU presidents who who were put on hold in terms of leaving their positions or taking other opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's very important. Um, no, I, yeah, fair. Yeah, okay, I, I got you. I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah. So like, so in, in that regard, if we have HBCU presidents taking taking leave or going wherever, and other cabinet level folks who are about to be about it here, then we might have a bigger issue because you, you don't have a leader and then you don't have a leader of a division. What are we what are we doing? So I think that's something to be um to be nervous about because when you don't have people in place, you can't make all the decisions that you need to have. But in light of COVID, that might be a good thing because we all need to be in our rooms. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, cool. We ain't got to do no nothing anyway because you know we shouldn't be in. We don't have leadership right now. Okay, cool. Your second question, um, I think you're very funny, um, but but to that, it would be more more along the lines of what Eric was saying. What can you do now to cement your legacy? Like we know what we're doing. We know what we've been forced into doing, um, and and that's becoming more hybrid based, um, accessible, making things accessible in terms of um, our court our coursework and and making sure that our students have what they need. But that's only because of a pandemic, not because we made plans to be um, operate like that in the twenty first century. Like we we don't have campuses. Uh, that could readily just transition to hybrid or fully online. So I think that's something that's uh, very important to, um, to to expand. Uh, so if I if I was in that position, I would you know concentrate on doing that because anything is possible. Like, you know, that's interesting. I, I would if if I was able, I, I I fully believe that we should be part of our emergency planning should be. If we're told we got to shut down, we can get everybody off campus within, you know, a, a couple of hours, depending on the size of the campus, um, and and transition. Have Blackboard ready. Have whatever um, platform the university uses. Have it ready to accommodate what we now have to shift to doing. Um, and honestly, sad reality is the only reason why. You know, we're here now in, in figuring that out is because of a pandemic that we had no idea was going to be this long. Um, so things that we should have been exploring in the first place. But HBCU presidents and chances, if they're good at no nothing else, they are excellent timekeepers. They know how to watch a clock. They know when certain debt and mortgage on construction is coming due. They know when uh certain accreditation issues are likely to rise you know on a five to a ten year increment they're excellent timekeepers and they know how to count money 
and they know when they can say i got it or i don't got it and how those two things converge and so and and you know this and without calling any names look at how many new presidents face intense criticism from alumni and faculty about one or two years in usually they're getting that kind of heat because their predecessor left something for behind that nobody knew about and when it's time to do something about it the new brother or the new sister is the one that got to deal with it and deal with the fallout i'll give you a perfect example early in because he's not there anymore kevin roman fisk he was, he was laying people off he was cutting programs he was doing a bunch of stuff when he first got there and people couldn't stand him for it get him out of here he's trying to destroy fisk history nobody knew what what the last president left behind in terms of how many bills you got coming and how much money is coming due on stuff and how much debt we have nobody saw that coming and so kevin when it was time to react to those bills he got the blame so i just say that to say keep in mind think about how many presidents and chancellors catch heat from their from their stakeholders early in their tenure that shows what happens before when somebody left why, but i would say greater why you bring up him why didn't you bring up frederick because even though I, no because and, and not and not because i dislike frederick but because <laughs> i know that but because i know that he was put in a tough situation if anybody knows the history about what Rabo did in his time that was there mm -hmm. right so like because i try to be nice but, 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 I'll, <laughs> but I'll, I'll flip it on i mean and it's not even a personal dig because at some point all this stuff is public record right mm -hmm. but i'll put on i put it on the opposite end you also have those situations where there is a pre there's presidents and or chancellors hint hint that they were not they were not liked for the things that they were doing because because they had a vision that was going beyond what people were thinking about mm -hmm. and then it only came to fruition after they left so the new person came in they really didn't have to do much to get a whole bunch of credit for things that they didn't put together <laughs> and then what happened then you get in a situation where it's two it's three four five years in and all those things that the predecessor had did start to like be old and you don't see the fruit of the labor of the person that's currently there and you're like oh he just here for a photo op <laughs> right so like <laughs> at, at some point the president like at some point like you, you're saying they're excellent they excellent timekeepers they're excellent at, at watching their money they're excellent knowing debts that's all well and good my ultimate question is is how well how well are presidents and these are the questions they got to answer for themselves how how good are they in being able to adjust on the fly because that's ultimately where it comes down to like i you five-year plans are great you got to get to five years the problem is is that most of our presidents only get to five years and and, and, and it depends on your skill set so for example if you and that's on the board and winston i'm gonna come to you in a second um if you if your board says okay we had a great we had a great fiscal manager as president in his last go round this brother or sister knew how to make money or how to, at least to account for it we didn't have a lot of waste we didn't have a lot of theft we paid off our bills we're good it's time to go get somebody who's a student affairs expert somebody who's gonna be big on enrollment who's gonna be big on developing athletics or something like that and that person comes in and then you have a financial crisis for some reason like covid like Pel like parent plus you got a student affairs expert there but you need a financial expert but that student affairs person has five-year contract or three-year contract mm. they don't have the skill set to deal with that crisis or for example you have you have a financial person coming in to follow a student affairs person and you got a, a, a shooting on campus or you got a, a rape on campus now you needed you needed somebody who can be the face of the institution but you got a nuts and bolts guy or girl see what i'm saying so it's always it's always difficult to deal with what and as you said in the first segment something is always going to happen something is always going to happen but it's 
it's the way that people leave things, maybe not even in a bad way. Maybe they just say this is a longer term project that I'm, I'm down to deal with. But Winston, I would come to you because you're you're in an organization um, in, in Midnight Golf that has a leadership structure like most. If, if your executive director, or your CEO tomorrow said, I'm out, I'm tired of dealing with this. <laughs> what kind of up, what kind of upheaval does that create create for the organization? Yeah, no, that's that. So, you know, to, to what we're talking about, even though know, for us, it would be it would be probably drastic because you're talking about the heartbeat of of what we do and, and the founder of what we do, which would be pivotal to, you know, the direction of our of the program, which is what we're talking about in general, the direction of the schools. I think it, it it's just like a, a president, like being the president of the United States of America. To me, it's like you have to also be comfortable with surrounding yourself with the people that, you know, can do things well that you can't. So if you you know to your point, if you are the person who, who boosts enrollment, you got to have the other people around you who know how to do the things that you don't do well to make sure that the structure is balanced. It's up to you as a good leader. A good leader is going to put talented people. In some cases, they argue people more talented than yourself to be able to do right. other things. Those those roles of cabinet are imperative roles. Like you hiring those people have to be the right hires. They have to be able to deal with the board. They have to be able to deal with you. They have to be able to do their job. These are you. you can, there's no substitute for having quality people around you to be able to have a ship and run a ship the right way. You make an excellent point, but I will give you something Ruth Simmons said on the podcast not too long ago. You, your, your, your goal as a president is to have good people. When you have good people, people come and take them. Oh, you're going to get poached. Yeah. That's, not, that's get not a diss. That's not a diss because Ruth has no. had two people going to become president since he's been in two, what, three years, three or four years? Yeah. That's a good so problem. Ruth knows how to identify talent, but she said, I can't, I can't keep them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> because that's, that's, it ain't that's frustrating. <laughs> no, but you got to keep doing that because you, and you need to quit. Yeah. You also have to keep fostering talent. So yeah. as you have those talents around you, there's other people in other positions that you're also, you should be grooming. Like there's, you know, conversations about that and not just it's a presidency, but even athletics and coaching and those other things yes. dealing with our institutions. That's all. Those are also imperative roles. You have to be nurturing those other great minds behind you. You need to be you should be facilitating those minds in the, in your cabinet and on your campuses and those things because it's imperative. Again, like to your point, that's part of that comes with the territory that, you know, you're going to get coached, you know, you're going to lose talent so you need to be able to foster the talent as well that's also imperative measures that you have to take into consideration in that role as a leader and as a president yeah tiffany looking sassy for some reason i guess that's a that's a move to go to the next uh the next conversation we're gonna have an extended conversation about respectability politics is it okay to twerk during brunch is it okay to twerk and dance during commencement yeah. <laughs> i just have to dog we'll be right we back, back. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into the let's get into the conversation. Um, and the overarching theme is black respectability politics. It stems from a recent case of folks in Dallas. Uh, I forget the, the the name of the restaurant. It starts true with a kitchen. K. I'm a true, true kitchen, kitchen and cocktail. true kitchen and cocktail. It starts with a K. I don't. I, I think that that's you know that's 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 Kappa esque to me. Um, so I you know he's a new he's a new is he so, <laughs> so, I think so I, you know. No twerking during brunch. No twerking during brunch. This caused an uproar online. Obviously, a lot of HBCU alumni have reaction to it. Oh, I know how this is going. We on. we came back into this conversation talking about oh, brunch know. culture in brunch culture in the DMV, particularly in DC, and what turned it into a twerk ready event anywhere in DC. Eric is positing that Howard students did it. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we made a correction. No, we made a correction. We made a correction. This is how we're doing it. Okay, the, the old school Generation X, like go go crowd, is literally like where the brunch turn up came from. Mm. But when it became a socialite event, where because it was like it's one of those things where it's like we would go to brunch. And just like do we like people been going to brunch here forever. We just sat here and talked about it. My father went to brunch in DC. I the first time I went to a DC brunch that was like a, a bottomless like food brunch, and my 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 folks had drinks and mimosas. I was seven. Like it just is what it is, right? So, but when it became a socialite event where people started to put on their outfits and get and bring out the Chelsea boots. And the random oh like how you getting like like done like you about to go to the club or when like brunches started to get merged with day parties yep. 
Mm -hmm. That did not start until I want to say the advent of the smartphone mixed with the boom that was like Howard on you, like and that influence. And I want to say that that's our generation. That's us that did that. Yeah, that's definitely a millennial thing. That's a yeah, and that, sure. that's the point that I was going to bring up because brunch is an extension of places, and I don't mean this term in the in the in a disrespectful way at all. In a social media area, your clout is built on your performance. Your performance yeah. might be your outfit. Your performance might be your dancing. Your performance might be your humor. But whatever I can catch on film and it's good content, mm. that's your performance. Mm. Brunch is 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 the place where you capture the energy and your performance. Yeah. Right. All together. So I don't think that it's the college crowd that did it because and I and I, and I say that even though the college crowd kind of drives the social media conversation, I don't think one, they could afford it. And two, I think that it, it's driven by more so young say alumni that. than it would be the actual say students. Say that out loud because that shouldn't be simple. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't. It depends on it depends on the school. No, but we, oh, 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 no, 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 because these are young adults. I'm talking about late 20s, mid 30s. Like, these are young mid, adults. Uh, right. <laughs> Listen, like, mid 20s, mid 30s drives brunch. Yeah. Facts. Facts. You agree? And, and, yeah. You're right. And on the, on the periphery of that are singles who are, are 35 and up. Listen, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know where y'all were at when they used to be this oh. DC, DC based. Oh. Groupon wow. type website called Capital Deal where you can go on there and buy our brunch like yeah. deals right with the bottom right. and being there for two why hours. Why tell me these things when I get invited to these brunches? And all like, that. Why I always pay the full price? <laughs> it's I a thing, bro. Listen, I've been I've been to a bottomless brunch in DC that was down southwest that cost me literally twenty one dollars, wow. including <laughs> the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, one of a but, that's lovely but to to bring this full to bring this full circle it might have been people who may have experienced who may have been either went to hbcus i don't th- i'm not gonna put it on us because we get blamed enough as it is but <laughs> if our but if our campuses have been <laughs> restrictive if mm. you will oh lord then is it possible that when we leave our restrictive respectability politic laden, we have to look a certain way because they're already looking at us because we're black campuses, <clears throat> that we leave our campuses and we are now dabbling in performative blackness? And how I would, this I would, I would I right not believe we letting him get away with that. I what? Here's, what, here's why I would disagree with that. I'm asking the question. No, no, I think it's a good question. I think it's legitimate, but here's why I think that I here's here's why I think it's I don't agree with it. I understand it, but I don't agree with it. Because a school like Hampton is socially restrictive. Going to Union on Thursday. Howard is restrictive in a lot of ways. Best by some measures, the best homecoming. So you know there what those HBCUs do is they give you a lane and say, go buck wild in this lane. Don't go buck wild out in front of the chapel. Don't go buck wild on the yard. Like they 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 give you a lane. It's college. It's it's college. I think they have to do that. But I think that where we cross the line again, and it goes back to the performance art. I want to perform when I want to perform. Right. Right. And so this this brings it this and and it's my body. I have agency over my body. I don't care if I'm in your establishment. I'm spending money in here. I have I agency. Have five over mimosas, over. Too. There's a DJ and I've had five mimosas. What do you want me to do? What do you expect? What do you think I'm going to do next? So, yeah, no, that's that's great, that's true. so you lecturing yourself now, right? What you mean? You know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. oh, yeah. No, no. No, right, get, no go ahead. Oh, right, go ahead. You right now. Okay, because you said it. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> oh, I know. You know. oh no, because remember when my other mother, the the Winston Salem State University, we get, we went viral because we had drum majors that actually performed <laughs> during commencement, and you were like, "What? What is this about?" But wait, what, what's, uh, listen, listen. what's the issue? I'm, I'm not. I'm not I saying I agree. With that. I'm talking about our conversation. He know what I'm talking about. Now, I will also. Oh, make- some of the cats in the cues. I'm not. I'm not saying I agree with it. 
I not, and, and we're going to get to that. That's why I made this part 30 minutes. <laughs> but if, I think you were getting you were getting ready to make a point about self agency. Yes, I was. And this is something that I've long said, and it really is very, very simple. Um, mm -hmm. if you want to oppress somebody, oppress yourself. Like that's literally what I think about mm -hmm. what I see. Like, okay, sis is twerking. Sis wants to throw her ass. That is sis. That's not necessarily what I'm going to do at any given time. Oh, but if this sis is over here doing in that in a circle, she got it. <laughs> but when, but when you were, this is what, this is what I say to my mom, my boomer mama. This is what I say to her because she, if she, if we ever were out somewhere and somebody walks in wearing something that they should not wear, mm -hmm. I know I ain't even got to look at her. I can feel her bristling like. <laughs> no. Let me tell you. Hold up, and I and I totally respect that because it's not her generation. Let it's me say not, this: as we, are, say, we are on the eve, we are on the eve of our beloved Founders Day. Mm -hmm. KD can vouch for this. I'm sure Eric can vouch for this. When you have been in an in an alpha event, and they play music that is geared towards younger brothers, older senior brothers, y'all move frown, on. Mm -hmm. They frown. Mm -hmm. Their wife. Grab their bag like Viola Davis, yep. and there's exit. Mm -hmm. As you should. And then when they exit, they go home and handwrite a letter and say, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like that. You're not. You're not running back your membership. You got to move out the way. You're not gonna be here. I right? didn't like that. No. -uh, but, you know but here's wrong. the point. Here's the point. I'm going to get to you, Katie, right there, because I, I want to make this connection to what my my, my feelings about self-agency and commencement and all that. Uh -oh. That is what I was talking about when I when I wrote years ago. At some point, you got to have I can understand expression and self-agency is celebration, particularly when you're somebody who's coming from a circumstance where you statistically weren't supposed to make it. Mm -hmm. That's not brunch. I'm talking about commencement now and respectability. Respectability is a joy. That you enjoy in your in your own space. Respect myself. However, comma, I do think that there is something that administrators have to consider when you have lawmakers, donors, influential people in the crowd who frown, right? And they wife close up that fur and say, "We're leaving," and then you have to answer for that because they have to write. They write the letter that says, "You, President or Chancellor, ought not allow that." Right. I, I know you got your hand raised on the zoom. <laughs> so Katie, go ahead. But that that's my so, point. Like you have to consider the young person only has to consider their time on stage. Mm -hmm. The president or the chancellor or the board has to consider everybody that's coming across the stage. So right. you do and what that may look like or what may happen. Go ahead, Katie. I, um, and I think we just it's such a thin line here between the, the self-agency and the thing that we want to project. Because I think the, the conversation at large is that black people want to be seen for who we are and we want to normalize all of our behaviors, not just one, but all of it and not be seen as a buffoon because we've had five mimosas and there's twerk music playing and I start twerking mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I understand the, um, the natural reaction. It's so it's like, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to tell a woman what to do with her body. I'm friends with entirely too many black women to try it. Right. I would get checked at the door. So it's, it's, it's not even that conversation. The conversation really is time and place. When do we designate a time and place for these things? Um, and this is what I hate about this generation. Why the hell do we record everything? Why? <laughs> <laughs> you have to record everything. Because the unfortunate part is, do you want viral, right? Because somebody was trying to sabotage his operation. And the thing that scared me more than the, the thing that bothered me the most was not that he um, said those words. It was that he had a packed restaurant in the midst of the pandemic. Like, my God, <laughs> there was not a mask in sight. Not in sight. <laughs> not in sight. <laughs> that should have been a conversation we're bro. having. I don't give about that young woman twerking. Don't mess up his furniture. I get that part. But why are they? Why are we in restaurants packed with no mask? I don't care about any of the restaurants. <laughs> that was the biggest issue. <laughs> and, 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 and this is he brings up the point that I. It's a lot going on here, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just a, it's, it's just a whole lot here. It's a lot right? to unpack. It's a, it's a whole lot to unpack because, and I, I've said this too, I was just like, if that man came out and said, listen, I want y'all to have a good time, 
but please respect those who are around you trying to eat and don't stand up on the furniture and, and don't stand up to the furniture and dance. If he has said that, some well, people I put think a, he did, but that's not what got recorded. So, so okay, so little small piece right here. We have a frat brother who is the nephew of the owner who gave a little small insight onto the fact that he had reached his wits end because he had been asking nicely and then he was getting stolen from and there was other things that were happening in the midst of all that that he that he he, he got to a point where he just went off the handle. That's not, I'm not getting to that right now. My issue is this. Don't make it about women twerking as a way of saying they're not respecting themselves. True. Fair. Because that's where it went left. Yeah, that's right? where it went left. Yeah. That's where it went left. Yeah. You, yeah. Right. If it was about people standing up on your furniture dancing, cool. Cool. I have no issue with that because personally speaking, as somebody who could not stand modeling troops walk like strutting through the cafeteria <laughs> and <laughs> and and people and, and DJs playing music in the cafeteria and people just the thought it was like a good time to stand up Hold on booths and whatnot. I, listen, I cringe when I see grown men wearing ba- um, boots on basketball courts. Like, like you know <laughs> you, 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 like you like it's just it's just certain things in my head like when you and so to your point right. Jerry it's like and I think the larger conversation is is that when when we start saying our unapologetic blackness, mm-hmm. we have to recognize that for each one of us, that means something, something different, different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? But what mm-hmm. we but the, uh, the the central thing is that your unapologetic blackness can be inappropriate in a moment. I'm not going to sit here and say twerking is inappropriate, but I can sit here and say that when people are sitting there eating food in a restaurant, if that's what's going on. Granted, it was a sports bar and he also had like a space, like an event space, but if people are sitting around eating food and whatnot, uh, I don't want you to sit down there <laughs> walking over my waffles. I'm just going to call it what it is, right? It's not the moment for that <laughs> in that moment, right? Yeah. That's so, but that's the that's the larger question. Like, I think that that's where we got to break it down. And I think that HBCUs are kind of central to that because our young people drive the culture. And so yeah. it's 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 Winston. I thought to you, I, I believe that it's yes. Everybody has time and space and autonomy over their time and space. But where we're in different quarters, are we? Is that still our space? Or are we leasing it for the moment from somebody else who is the proprietor of that spot? Or are we leasing it from, um, you know, a campus culture? You know what I mean? Like, there, I heard somebody say to me one time, you know, dancing on the stage at, at commencement, for example, or doing certain things on a college campus. You know where you don't see that? You don't see them dancing at Hampton. You don't see it at Fisk. Because those young people, they party hard, but they say, we respect that. Here's where my time and space is, and here where it's, here's where it's not. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's part of the culture. So in this in the sense that people own a restaurant, own a bar or, you know, we're running a student union or we're running a dorm lobby or whatever the case may be. Are people leasing their time and space or do they own it wherever they stand? I think it kind of it's kind of stems similar from the leadership conversation we were having, because I think those things trickle down. You know, you, you mentioned a Hampton or a, a Fisk and the, and the culture that's created there. You know, you also think about the kind of students who get accepted to those institutions, a private institution that can be a little bit more on the costly side for a young person. You know, maybe they're, you know, it's already a certain level that you of student and young person or experiences that you have at institutions like that, as opposed to, you know, something that's maybe a VUU that's not the same. Virginia Union maybe is not the same environment, the same type of students holistically that you're getting, you know, across the board. So it creates it does lend to a certain culture, to a culture of young people who believe a certain air about themselves, you know, and so and, and follow fall in line with what the leadership um, proposes that those young people, the way they should behave, the kind of students that they intentionally recruit, you know, that continue to have interest in those institutions that can play a role in those things. So, I mean, whether or not, it's tough to say, um, you know, if we're leasing the space or we own the space, Um, In those instances, I think it's kind of like a case by case basis when you hire a DJ and you have bottomless mimosas for me, you you're running the risk of me having a good time. Maybe I dance. Maybe I'm going to get up and do a little jig for the Detroit people. I mean, it's just it just is what you know, it creates the culture that you are are accustomed to. And and I think to Eric's point, you I mean, 
you know, there's people who may not agree with that, who may not think just because there's a DJ there, just because most of that you don't, that doesn't mean you need to be doing those things. But there's another group or sect of people who is almost like a natural bodily function in in certain in said circumstance that this is what I'm this is my go to. I just wonder, like, if the reaction would have been the same if a, a group of young gentlemen hit the quad. Um, and it got recorded, right? <laughs> and, and I think that is that that's part of my it's like, yo, I don't think you're you know what? actually I, I you know what? that's a there, that's right? an interesting question. Yeah. Because if, if me, you, and Eric started strolling right in any given bar between here and Baltimore, people would probably clap. Yeah, they would embrace it all day. Depending on the time of day, they would probably be like, Okay, there go the alphas, cool. Wow, but if sisters started it's I know. A, not something that we did. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But if sisters started twerking in that same environment, they probably be like, oh. And so you know, to the to the point that that's that's sexist, and we got to deal with that. And to the point that that's that, women do it. Don't put that on just men. Women. We, okay, and women can be sexist. <laughs> listen, women, I, women can have internalized I, sexism listen, and misogyny. Okay. I'm gonna say, <laughs> like, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this. The whole conversation, though, the one part that he was getting said that I and you kind of brought it up, so I'm, I'm gonna keep in that lane, Jared. A certain song being played or a certain DJ being played does not control bodily functions at some point. Because I'm gonna let you know right now, every single time I hear "Wipe Me Down," you will not see me strolling. <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? We're, like, we're so, out, like, though, it's different. Listen, no, listen, it don't matter. It don't, <laughs> listen, lead from the front. <laughs> every every single time, juveniles back that ass up gets played. You make a you make a conscious decision <laughs> in that moment. Yes, they do. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. like. Like, yeah, yes. If you if you got liquor in your system, cool. But like, okay, I, <laughs> and, 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 and my, and, you know, what, to and I would bring it up this way: you don't see Sigma's stroll every single time back to that ass was played. You don't. Yeah, not. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I I just don't. I mean, you you being maybe, too much. Maybe it's where I go. <laughs> Maybe I, don't, maybe I don't hang out with Sigmas. Maybe that's it is what it is. <laughs> not players, but it is what it is, right? But, but you're right. It, it's a conscious decision either way. But I think I think I think multiple truths exist at the same time, right? Like, yes, even for our schools, there's a time and place. But with our schools, when these some of these events are going on, guess what? If I was a president, I would say, Are you going to write a check for the amounts of money that this event that had this cultural norm that we've established here brings in so that when you come here, you don't have to see it. Are you going to write the check? Because I guarantee you right now, ain't nobody got enough money to stop Howard Homecoming's Yard Fest from being Howard Homecoming's Yard Fest because for what it does for Howard, you're not going to stop that. So you can complain all you want to, but keep that complaint to yourself. But I, I would just say this, and I would say this for an establishment, I would say for a school, if you're a leader, why don't you just be upfront with the constituent? So, for example, if I own a restaurant or a bar and I'm going to say and I'm and I'm planning on having a DJ because that helps bring in the, the money. I'm going to say, OK, from 10 to 10 to one, this mm. is a gospel brunch. Mm. And then from one to four or one to five, this is the day party. So every every patron type, I, I'm just I'm just throwing out stuff. I'm just saying <laughs> every, patron, every patron would be aware like this is what you're going to get now. If you choose to twerk the gospel, some people that's do. your thing. But you know what? Though? But what I'm saying is, that, at though. least patrons are aware that this is the situation here, and I, and this is I'm trying to section off and prevent anyone from being offended by anything. It's right. the same thing for for HBCU commencement. Like I would tell my students, you can get up there and dance if you want to dance. If you fall. If you step a foot, if you're stomping and you go through one of these planks on this stage, you clip up over these cords, you fall on your head. Do you know the bill that I'm going to send you for the insurance premium that you that this is going to cover? That transcript is out. Do you know? Do you know that? <laughs> you know that when I get letters, no degree when deferral. I get letters from when I get letters from the lawmakers and the donors <clears throat> that I'm going to personally put your name in a, an open letter in the next alumni <laughs> magazine. No, player. Player, you might say, go, go to somewhere else and get another four years. Yeah, yeah you're not getting that. You ain't never seeing that degree. You ain't gonna never see that degree. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But but you see, like, just be transparent. Like, young people can handle it. Young people can handle a conversation. You may want to dance and make it about you, and you should. 
Hey, listen, but make a is something, that is not a concert stage. And the moment you do that is the moment you bring heat to the school. You individually bring heat to the school. Yeah. Your moment brings stress and, uh, and tension for the school. Yeah. So you think it's just 30 seconds of you praise dancing. That's going to be 30 angry letters that I'm going to get. We can, yeah. these are young adults. We can have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and, and let me be very clear if it was just me, dancer, all you want to dance, brother or sister, you might be the first person in your family to go to college and graduate. You probably been through some tough times where you didn't think you were going to make it. You should dance your ass off. You just can't do it on this stage. <laughs> You well, can't do it on stage because I think it's the leadership. It goes I to the leadership. Make a waiver. Make a sign of waiver. Call, call it a day. Like, listen. All right. Li- listen. If anything should should happen to you in the process of you doing whatever you want to do during commencement, we are not financially liable, and you may have to pay if you would cause any damage. I see absolutely no issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. I said it's a culture. I think you set this the stage. Is it goes back to that the leadership thing of you to your point, Jared, of setting the culture there. I mean, I think about here in Detroit, the auto show was a thing. It was always a big thing here, and but and it was an unknown rule. It wasn't a said rule, but like you knew you left before seven o'clock when them scallywag kids was coming in and it was getting dark. <laughs> it was about to be a you knew to get those stuff to get out of Detroit Cobo Hall. And but before <laughs> seven o'clock, because it was gonna be pro- and we was them. We were the kids that was coming at seven o'clock. We were the kids. <laughs> it was <laughs> kids at seven o'clock to, to get reckless, and so you like knew to get out of there. Was a party? Oh, oh, when we, oh, when we was coming up. Oh, you get all the numbers. You talking to all the? I mean, it was it was like that. That's when it but, got dark in the auto show. Huh. It's like a deep see, that, um, with cars. Like so, yeah. the point that, that our our young people drive the culture, and I'm I'm looking at this through the eyes of literally through the lenses of an old man. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm against it. I'm actually for it. I'm actually for the. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, <laughs> I can also understand as a business proprietor, when people say I'm leaving and I'm not coming back, that hurts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when a patron did it. So yeah. I'm just trying to figure out like where where do we make how do we find the happy medium here where you still feel like you got the word is transparency 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 yes we find the happy medium in people doing their own work and doing your own work as i've said before means um if you want to oppress somebody you oppress yourself doing your own work means figuring out why does this piss you off why do you think it's inappropriate that somebody else is using their body how they want to use it? Like, I get it. We might be, you know, at a commencement. We might be at a restaurant. We might be somewhere else. But, like, why does it bother you that much to where you would write a letter? Like, and I'm somebody that write letters and send emails. If you do something, <laughs> you know, but and you, you write, write the letter. Up, Oh, I've already looked your stuff up. I did it at Kroger on Thanksgiving Eve. So, like, I did Definitely was righteous, but not not on. I'm hating because you over here free and I'm not. Like, do your own work. Do your work. I'm gonna do my work and try to uh, self moderate my criticism of cat suits attracting cues. On Instagram, oh, I will. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes Dodgers yeah, in the Dark. I want to thank. I want to thank everybody. It's so crazy. Tune in to Series One Forty Two X Series X and One Forty Two HBC Radio. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back next week. Depending on if HBC is actually doing something, I appreciate you listening. We, we so appreciate you. Love you guys. Thank you for gracious.